Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the second session of the Great Thinker series organized by KGRI. We're very happy to have Professor Red Ray, Red Ray here from the Columbia University to talk today about uh, cyber norms. Uh, before that, I kindly want to point out there will be recordings of the event. The event will be used for communication purposes and will be published online later. We kindly ask you as well to refrain from uh, taking too many pictures and politely not with flash because it might be a bit disturbing for the panelists and the speakers. Um, before I give it the, the floor to the professor, I kindly want to introdu introduce uh, Professor Jun Marai. He's the co-director of the Cyber Civilization Research Center where I work as well, and he is a professor at the Faculty of Environment and Information Studies at Keio University. Welcome, June, please. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to, yeah, on behalf of the uh, organizer of uh, uh, this, uh, is this a conference or a symposium or whatever? <laughs> whatever it's going to be called. But uh, this is a great opportunity to uh, discuss about the very uh, complicated and interesting and exciting uh, subject of the, uh, the uh, cyberspace uh, discussion. So uh, hosted by uh, the uh, Cyber Civilization Research Center. Um, so let me briefly uh, introduce about the Cyber Civilization Research Center, which is uh, under the uh, KO Global Research Institute. And uh, so, uh, uh, therefore, this is a, uh, very much a, you know, kind of a university-wide uh, research institute to, to discuss about the cyberspace, and uh, it's a civilization concept. So uh, uh, it's uh, called a civilization because uh, now the digital uh, technology is uh, for everyone and the society uh, human beings going to utilizing the digital technology uh, as a tools for developing the new society. And uh, uh, one more point is that uh, now the probably uh, 60 uh, plus percent uh, of the human population are accessing the internet, but uh, uh, we are expecting that in five or less than 10 years, then it's going to be like a uh, more than 80% of the population, human populations will be accessing the internet, which is uh, you know, kind of basics of the uh, entire human being on the other civilization because it's uh, digital tools, digital data, and the digital technology is for uh, every single person's life now in the society and the industry government. So, um, so a lot of uh, new things. Before internet, there's no such a thing like a truly global space, but uh, now we have a real space and the cyberspace uh, together, and uh, then uh, this is the reality of our society. So uh, the global versus uh, international versus uh, domestic, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, legal issue about uh, each of the spaces. So uh, um, complicated thing. So uh, therefore, uh, it's, uh, and the stakeholders are everywhere, industries, government, uh, scientists, and uh, uh, you know, the national security people, uh, politicians. Um, so uh, it's a really, uh, we uh, started to think that it's really important that the university is gonna uh, creating the place uh, for dialogue uh, among the various uh, stakeholders around the world. And uh, so uh, that's how uh, we have started. The similar uh, organization exists in uh, uh, many, many uh, leading universities in the world. Therefore, we have decided to have a kind of collaboration uh, with uh, uh, each of them. So uh, that's how uh, we are planning, uh, you know, as a background of uh, today's discussion. And uh, we have a uh, uh, great honor uh, to invite uh, Greg from uh, Columbia University, who's uh, been a good friend of ours in uh, various spaces uh, already, and uh, then inviting the uh, experts uh, for the discussion from the various uh, stakeholders and the ex various type of uh, diversity of expertise. That's uh, our fortunate, and thank you very much for uh, getting together. As uh, announced, then uh, uh, we are uh, trying to 
uh, record uh, what we have uh, discussed in the, during this type of uh, panel discussion and the lecture, uh, lectures and uh, uh, so that uh, we can share the uh, wisdom uh, for the more of the people over the internet. So uh, thank you very much again for the, uh, joining us and uh, then I hope uh, your questions, uh, participation on the discussion is gonna be uh, uh, highly appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, and then I have the pleasure of uh, um, inviting Craig over to here. Uh, Craig is here foremost and to build further on what Professor Morai said. For us, it's the kickoff of the global cyber dialogue between the CCSC and KGRI and Columbia University. To give a bit of a background into Craig's history and work, he started off in the Air Force. That's where he started off as an intelligence, uh, intelligence officer, then graduated at the Air Force Academy for his undergrads, went to the Harvard Kennedy School uh, for a Master in Public Policy, and finally got his PhD at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Um, he stayed in the Air Force until 2007, commanded a number of cyber warfare uh, units, uh, meanwhile worked during the Bush 44 administration as the head of cybersecurity at the National Security Council, and then in 2007 went into private consultancy business uh, to be followed by working as the chief cybersecurity officer for J.P. Morgan Chase. Then in 2019, uh, he, joined, he went back to the field of academia and joined Columbia as a senior research professor where he currently still is and where he is going to kick off the dialogue with us. So we're looking forward to his speech. Thank you very much for coming all the way here from New York. We're uh, excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you, June. I very much appreciate the uh, invitation here to speak at KO University, you know, a great global university. And as you'll hear me say, and I think there'll be a theme throughout the afternoon, uh, the nature of cyberspace and the digital environment becoming ever more important in the globe uh, requires collaboration. And, you know, we are at a time where that is not necessarily a natural act, particularly at the governmental level, therefore ever more important for sort of to begin with, sort of joint understanding of what the issues are, um, and then you know seeking to foster dialogue, and then hopefully collective or collaborative action. So, <clears throat> as I thought about the talk I would give, because I was given pretty open-ended sort of uh, what the subject would be it was up to me, how you know what to talk about. Uh, this is something I've worked on, you know, in. Uh, throughout my career, including even before I got into the cyberspace realm, and I'm going to use examples of, you know, the challenges that, you know, complex environments and environments that aren't strictly under control present in terms of collaboration, but also try to create some hopeful notes about the fact that uh, cooperation is possible and collaboration is possible and essential uh, to making pr progress. Um, I'll speak in English today. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to focus a lot on, like, what to think about and the inherent trade-offs involved in achieving cybersecurity, not necessarily down in the details or trying to provide a lot of answers. Uh, as a person who's you know, trained academically as an international relations specialist, um, and you know, not a technical specialist. I think that cybersecurity is often not well understood in terms of all the different aspects of it that are beyond the, the simple uh, technology piece. It, it is inherently a technological environment, and many of the challenges that are in, in actions that need to be taken are technical. But I think it's very important to understand the, the broader perspective on this. So. I think you know there's a lot of hard questions. I think that'll get raised. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty, and I think understanding that that's the case and there aren't easy solutions is part of what I want to talk to. But I also hope to provide some reason for hope uh, in a situ in a you know subject matter. I, I, I'll say later that I think the cybersecurity environment continues to get more challenging and we're not making uh, enough progress, but I do think there are ways we can, we can solve for that. Um, I'm gonna mention the notion of cost and who pays a lot. I think a lot of the real challenges in cybersecurity are just not really understanding what's motivating the economics behind action and what needs, and you know, how to think about that helps us uh, 
drive the right sorts of behaviors. Also spend a, a, a number of, uh, you know, talk to a number of different situations which require understanding where the public sector acts versus where the private sector acts. And I think one of the things that, that I find, having served on both sides of that uh, divide and having been in a dialogue on these issues for probably 25 years or so, is that both sides wants the other side to solve it. That the private sector believes that cybersecurity is a governmental responsibility and the, a lot of the dialogue is, is in terms of what governments will do. Um, governments, you know, turn around and look at what the private sector uh, should be doing and, you know, and the question becomes what is appropriately the role of the government and what is appropriately the role of the private sector. So I'll give you my opinions about that. Okay, so first technical challenge, advancing the slides. There we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, I wanted to ground the talk initially just in sort of the notion of what is it, the, the cyber ecosystem and, you know, um, so we have a common understanding. Again, I, I focus a lot on that it's, you know, the technology is the, the sort of core. It has physical components, large to small, all the way from satellites down to small IoT devices that, you know, move, uh, you know, are the basis for moving digits. There's layers of uh, the technical, the, you know, the computing stack, you know, applications. So you have cybersecurity tools like firewalls and intrusion detection mo monitors. Uh, but you also have bad devices like, or bad technologies such as malware and password crackers. And these are the things that when people talk about cyberspace and cybersecurity get a lot of attention. I think over time people start, have started to realize that a lot of what needs to be attended to are people. So there's two people up there, one of whom is in the room, the other of whom is seen very much as a farther of the internet, uh, Vint Cerf and June Marai. But it's the people that both created the environment, but now are making decisions about how the environment works technically, but also how corporations use uh, the internet and how uh, individual you know, people have embedded the internet in, the, in digital uh, interactions into their lives. And I put the word connections up there. I could have, I was toying with the idea of putting processes process up there, but the notion of, you know, we use this technology to make connections. Um, you know, how, how these, how we leverage the internet in the ecosystem to do our daily lives, to, to uh, conduct business and now to conduct government and even to conduct conflict. If in a broad sense, these are the key elements of the ecosystem. Uh, and I, I've heard, June, you talk about this, you know, the notion of different levels of activity is important. When I think about levels of uh, activity, I tend to gravitate to these four levels. You can, so I'm, some might argue that the third and fourth le levels are similar, but to think about this in terms of who the user is, what their behaviors are in the ecosystem, and then what their responsibilities are when it comes to security, or safety, and I do think you know what we see is you know all the way down in this uh, in this system that even individuals have the ability to access it and influence ecosystem-wide results. So you have to understand individual motivations. You have to uh, definitely understand organizational. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about how this works in large companies and you know uh, what company roles are versus governmental roles, but. You know, organizations are not just uh, companies. I'm th talking about sort of governmental organizations, private sector organizations. Then there's the issue of national governments, and then there are global outcomes. And I think one of the key things to talk about this afternoon is how the international environment between nations is one without global governance per se. We have the UN, but uh, I think we're in a time in geopolitics where competition is rising and governments have a hard time collaborating or cooperating with each other. But as an inherently global environment, the outcomes for the globe may not be uh, optimal or it may not be good if we can't achieve some level of cooperation. So I'm going to look at, sort of throughout the talk, two metaphors. Uh, one has to do with 
why nation states compete and how they try to find a way, even when they're competitors, to avoid things like arms races and unintentional wars. And then I'm also going to talk about you know, the need to focus at the global level on you know, achieving outcomes that are healthier. And if you think about that broadly, uh, and the metaphor that's probably going to be used the most is global warming, is that the individual incentives are not necessarily aligned uh, properly to achieve the overall health of the ecosystem. But we, and we need to pay attention to that and try to find a way to incentivize behavior that contributes to global health, even if uh, companies and nations uh, don't necessarily naturally uh, cooperate when it comes to cybersecurity. So again, the talk is at a pretty high level. I'll use some specific examples, but uh, I wanted to get into what I think is challenging in the cybersecurity ecosystem. As a person that's worked in, you know, mostly focused on cybersecurity for, I would say, the last 25 or 30 years, I think people have tended to talk about the third bullet on this slide uh, mostly, and I wanted to really start with what I think fundamentally causes challenges for cybersecurity, and, and, and my belief is that's because we, we're producing what is a global good or we're producing what is actually a good thing, but it comes with some inherent insecurities and, and trying to balance that is, uh, is the most challenging aspect of achieving cybersecurity. So again, uh, we have got some of the you know, people that were here from the inception of the internet uh, in, in the room, but you know, this environment was designed initially to be, you know, foster interaction between particularly universities that in, there was a lot of inherent trust and the, the environment was designed to make things easier. It wasn't designed to be a place where things were highly secured. And I find, you know, having lived through a lot of the, uh, the evolution, you know, since probably my first cognizance of all this was the, the, you know, the creation of the first websites and the, the, uh, so the World Wide Web coming onto the scene and not just using email but having this other mechanism to use the internet in the mid-90s, that every revolution that I've seen on the internet in the, the subsequent 25 years has been driven by people, organizations want connectivity, they want things to be easy to use, and they want things to move quickly. And the internet has fostered you know, an explosion of you know, value creation for businesses, ability for people to interact globally. I mean, those of us who have friends globally, the ease at which you can communicate with a, fr a friend across, across the world is amazing for somebody who you know, used to have to make a very expensive phone call 20, you know, 20 or 30 years that these benefits of the information revolution or the digital revolution for society have been you know, great. Uh, the challenge has been that security is a trade-off for most of these things. That making a more secure system requires us to uh, give, give up connectivity, ease of use, or speed in many cases. I think you know, the extent to which technologists can solve some of those problems and create security while still advancing, you know, the ease of use or the value of using uh, digi the digital environment is uh, sort of technically the inherent, the inherent challenge. Um, the second point is, again, a person who, uh, you know, was really 30 when the technology started to hit, you know, now I'm now 57, and so the last 25 years, watching the adoption of uh, these technologies is this hasn't been government controlled. These are not highly engineered advances in the technology. And the pace at which we are adopting the technology to do new things all the time just rap really challenges the governance of the space, government policy, legal constructs, international relations. These, these systems of controlling what happens in an environment where the eco economies, people's safety are at risk is, has proven very challenging. Now 
with so much of our human life, you know, sort of dependent on, it's a choice we make, but, you know, using cyberspace, the amount of time we spend interacting with people, conducting transactions uh, in cyberspace, you know, is increasing. Again, the nature of social life has changed dramatically, I would say, over the last 15 years um, in, in advanced societies, but even, you know, I think globally in terms of, you know, the use of uh, the digital environment. And now the safety issues are, are upon us, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'll talk a lot from the perspective of being in a global financial institution. Our economy, like the underpinning and the move of our economy, the movement of money, uh, most companies cannot go back to doing business outside the digital realm. They've made that transition. If cyberspace doesn't work, many economic functions across, you know, will not work, and even some of the essential functions in terms of providing power or electricity are increasing, increasingly reliant on cyberspace, but certainly our economic functioning and our financial system is totally dependent on cyberspace. And you know, the risks that were involved in doing this and the fact that cyberspace can be made disrupted or corrupted or manipulated, I don't think we're sort of baked in as a, an American expression, but thought through fully when we decided to move functions into cyberspace. And then people, all sorts of people, from in individuals to government leaders, have realized that cyberspace is also a place where you can achieve your goals maliciously or through criminal action, through disruptive attacks. Um, I will say that I think it's pretty, pretty sound ground, pretty easy to say that, at least in the criminal realm, but I would say even in competition between states, that the gains you can achieve by using uh, cyberspace to commit criminal acts, to cause disruptive attacks, uh, currently outweigh the risks. That we haven't figured out how to find the people make, undertaking malicious actions, discipline the technical environment so that those actions are hard to commit, and that there's, in the criminal realm, there's, very, there's still very low chance you'll be found out as you commit fraud, you know, money movements. At the international level, there's still very significant challenges to attributing who's conducting cyber attacks, and all of these things uh, make the environment uh, you know, challenging in terms of achieving security. <clears throat> so, I wanted to sort of go back and out of cyberspace for a few minutes and just talk about two sorts of challenges that ex exist in Antarctic, in Antarctic, well, I'm going to get to Antarctica actually, in anarchic or systems without sort of central control. Um, I, my academic background is very much in political science and international affairs. So the notion of, um, what's called the state of nature. There's a, a political scientist theorist called Thomas Hobbes who coined that term and said that the, you know, the, the state of nature is uh, nasty, brutish, and short. And what he was referring to was the fact that if there's nobody in control at the center, humans do not have great natural inclinations and will treat each other very poorly and this was the rationale for, for government and governmental control so that you could get out of the state of nature. Um, in, the, in the international security realm, this is also often referred, referred to as the security dilemma. And you know, while the theory around this developed a lot in the Cold War and the nuclear age, and that's why the missile's there on the right, there's a person named Thucydides who wrote a book about the wars in Greece uh, you know, between Sparta and, Sparta and Athens, and this metaphor is being used a lot now in the 21st century in terms of the rise of China as a competitor of the United States and the fact that uh, Melios is up there because uh, there was a competition between uh, Sparta and Athens, and the question was who should control Melios, and basically there's a famous uh, famous portion of the book called the, uh, the Melian Dialogue, and the, the basic theme is he who has the power will take control of the environment. So 
The, the theory behind that is because states don't trust each other and because no one's in charge above the state, that they, are, they will tend to be suspicious and build up their own capabilities to be sure that they'll be safe. But the problem is the other states around them see that rise in capability and that they, they then you know, also build more capability resulting in things called arms races. So the, the image to the right of the map of the Aegean Sea is a, a Polaris nuclear missile coming out of a submarine. My background is I uh, graduated from the Air Force Academy in the mid-1980s. We still were in a uh, Cold War with the Soviet Union, and most of our attention on security was focused on the arms race with the Soviets around nuclear weapons. As I'll talk about, there were ways to keep that under control, but this essential condition definitely exists again in cyberspace. And how do we provide some pathway to collaboration when the environment is not under central control and we have a security dilemma? So I'll talk to that. The, the second one, and the one that I think really is is an individual and technological challenge, less of a governmental challenge, is environmental change and avoiding the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons is the notion of if there's a common public space and everybody's allowed to use it, but that public space, the use of that public space uh, you know, causes externalities. If you overuse your portion of the public space, others pay for it, and the, the tragedy in the commons is the notion of everybody can graze their, their goats, their sheep on a public space, but if everybody does it, the commons will no longer exist. That, you know, you've got to figure out a way to properly share the environment and, be, and generate responsible behavior. I think the environment, I mean, the, the challenge of global warming is today's tragedy of the commons. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to the fact that you know, while that problem's widely recognized, progress on it has been uh, slow, and this is very similar to the cybersecurity environment, where the, the fact that cybersecurity is challenging and that we need a cleaner cyber environment is highly recognized, but we're not doing the difficult things necessary to improve that environment. But now I'm gonna to try to be a little more hopeful. So um, there, are, there are ways to you know, make progress even though there are these, the environment isn't under central control with a benevolent person in charge. Um, you know, the notion of a cyber si silent spring is part of the activities at Keio University to avoid, you know, getting to a cyberspace where we wake up in the future and you know we don't get to take advantage of all the the all the advantages just like a book was written about the environmental challenges i believe in the early 60s uh where that if we didn't take care of the environment we would end up with a, you know we would wake up one spring and the in nature would not be there and things would be silent the, the Cold War experience, again, is something that I can directly relate to. Most of the people in this room, I can tell, have, <laughs> didn't, don't, have to, don't have that experience directly. But I put a uh, picture of Antarctica up there. Well, I'm going to talk to the red phone first. Anybody, anybody in the room happen to know what that red phone might actually be a picture of? What do you think, Sparky? You, you, know, I, I said, you know what it is? What is it? Exactly right. Well done. So the, the, red, the red phone is actually a picture of one of the red phones that existed probably in the White House. It could be, it could be the Kremlin, I don't, I don't know. Where the Russians and the Americans, because they had nuclear weapons and they knew they could have misunderstandings, this actually, those hotlines were put in after the Cuban Missile Crisis. In, so the Cuban Missile Crisis was 1962. I think the phones were installed in like 1964, 1965. And they were to allow the Russian and US leaders to talk if there was something had gone on and they were scared about escalation to a nuclear conflict. I mean, this is possible in the cyber realm. Uh, the notion that 
you know, we have a lot of suspicion about the actions that are being undertaken, internet disruptions at times, you know, are these things that are the result of a, another country's malicious actions? Well, we need to create the communication pathways between countries so that, you know, actions, misperceptions of what is happening in the environment can be cleared up uh, more quickly. So in political science and, you know, in political science and international security uh, speak, that's often called establishing confidence building uh, measures. And there are things you can do. The, another area of confidence building measures is when military forces practice operating. Uh, these are called military exercises. They've occurred, you know, they occur still all over the globe. That the two sides notify each other of those of those exercises, so they're not look like they do not look like mobilization for war. Again, this is a notion of communication, establishing confidence to avoid unintended conflicts. We need to continue to uh, find these sorts of measures in cyberspace and, and, and have governments have mechanisms to talk with each other. Establishing norms, I put up a, a picture of Antarctica up there because this was one of the earliest agreements between, in the Cold War between countries to put off limits an area for competition. Uh, in, in 19, I think it was 58, the, the Russians or the Soviet Union, the United States, and I think there were 12 other signatories, all agreed never to put nuclear weapons in Antarctica. I mean, the notion there was let's take an area of the globe where people, that, at that stage in history, people were just ex starting to explore Antarctica and at least say that that is off limits uh, for nuclear weapons. Uh, there's, act, there's also an outer space treaty which made outer space off limits for nuclear weapons. The, the fundamental idea here is even competitive actors can decide that certain areas are not the right place for competition and make agreements or establish norms. In cyberspace, there's been an interesting discussion uh, about whether certain systems should be put off limits for attacks. Uh, two sort of leading examples that I think would be good areas for the establishment of norms are the internet, the systems that serve the internet backbone, like the routing system and the domain name system, as well as, uh, and this was, I spent a lot of time working on this notion, that the global financial system should not be subject to cyber attacks. Um, the, to be aware in the room, there is active work in this area. There has been for a long time. The, the, the Russians proposed a, a, a cyber arms control treaty all the way back to 1998. The UN has been active since probably about 2007 through a group, group of global experts. Uh, Japan's part of that group, as well as the United States, China, and Russia, as well as I think 13 or 14 other countries, some of which rotate. But they issued a set of declarations in 2015 about critical infrastructure not being subject to attack. So at the political level, there is some work on establishing norms in cyberspace. Um, the challenge is that really people are not, uh, countries are not paying attention to those norms. And in, in, in going forward, I think the question is, how do you establish any count accountability in cyberspace where attacks are hard to attribute and, you know, in reinforcing that bad behavior is occurring and that the norms need to be followed? So while we have what is called, you know, rules of the road or the establishment of norm norms for behavior, we don't have much enforcement. I put the... the uh, International Atomic Energy seal up there because in the, the nuclear realm, the Non-Proliferation Treaty has a dedicated international organization that conducts inspections, uh, does research, and basically declares whether a certain country is following the norms of not, you know, non-proliferation, which in this case means not developing nuclear weapons, which is agreed by most but not all countries in the globe. And there's a, there's a system for enforcing those norms in terms of an agency that identifies transgressors or people violating the norm. And I did want to mention, because I think it's a very hopeful note, 
that recently there's a Cyber Peace Institute uh, has been formed. The Institute is a collaborative activity of, uh, I believe, Microsoft, MasterCard, um, the Hewlett Foundation. I, you know, I know they're seeking other members and they have some other participants, but the, one of the central ideas beside, behind the Cyber Peace Institute, which I would encourage you to, to look up, um, is that these companies are going to identify situations where malicious actions are occurring in cyberspace, provide the technical details for those activities, and hopefully motivate government, government actions for transgressions against norms. So if somebody attacks the financial system in cyberspace, the Cyber Peace Institute would do the technical research to try to provide evidence that you know, a transgression had occurred that in what they're struggling with is the question of whether they declare a nation or a government responsible, but I think the basic idea is to leverage the technical expertise that exists in the private sector to describe the nature of cyber attacks and put the pressure on governments in order to punish transgressors in cyberspace of those attacks. And for me, as a person that grew up in government but worked in the private sector, that cyberspace is uh, increasingly an area where trying to achieve security at the ecosystem level will require collaboration between the private sector and governments, that security here isn't solely a governmental uh, responsibility and the expertise necessary actually resides often in the private sector in terms of identifying malicious activity is a, is a new one. The other <clears throat> sort of theme I wanted to work on in terms of where we have opportunities for collaboration is in the area of a healthier cyber ecosystem. So I use this metaphor a lot that the internet is like a swamp from a security perspective. Uh, there's alligators in there. It's hard to see what's down in there. If you're the chief information security officer of a global bank, you feel like you're trying to, you're on this little island that you're trying to keep secure and healthy and that alligators are not gonna climb onto your island from the swamp and, and steal your money or attack your, your customers. Um, and this gets back to what I had mentioned earlier that unhealthy behavior in this, in this ecosystem, allowing it to maintain a swamp has negative impacts for everybody in the system. You know, if, if computers, whether they're in the hands of individuals or, or organizations, are left unsecured, those computers are taken over by criminals or by uh, nation states and, and used maliciously against uh, other people that are connected to the internet or, or in cyberspace. Um, I've spent a lot of time uh, on the, you know, in, on the challenge of what's called botnets and you know, the formation of networks of computers under the control of malicious actors. And again, that is both uh, criminal groups and state actors. And the, the fact that if you're running security for a global bank, those sets of computers are used to disrupt your websites. They're used to uh, do what's called phishing or send uh, messages that allow for intrusions into your employees or to your customers. So this unhealthy behavior out there in terms of not keeping your computers clean threatens everybody else. The question is, how do we get better at this? And you know, I, I am very sympathetic to the notion that you need to measure, you know, the, measure the state of unhealthiness or measure how sound the security is in, at different levels of the ecosystem and hold actors accountable for uh, cyber health. And I, I do think this has a lot of analogies to you know, the notion of uh, keeping the environment clean, the responsibility of us as individuals to you know, uh, do the right things in terms of you know, our ecological behavior, for companies to you know, uh, make companies to make sure that their operations are carbon neutral in the case of global warming. Um, and then up at the higher level, the governments 
need to be accountable for whether their environments are, clept, are kept clean or not. I, I actually think the, the sort of better way to think about ecosystem health at the government level is what the World Health Organization has evolved to be over many years, which is you know, clear accountability and measurement of the presence of disease, of the presence of other health factors. The World Health Organization measures in things like uh, you know, the present obesity, the presence of smoking, sort of fundamental indicators of things that will be un unhealthy, and publishes all these things publicly so that public policy can be uh, formed in order to you know, hold accountable those, in, that, in this case, countries who might not have the right approach to you know, securing cyberspace or making people healthy. The other sort of element of this is in both sort of health issues, but cyber health issues as well, or cyber security issues, is that certain countries or certain actors are not as well resourced. So the fact that you're measuring the system and holding or understanding which countries are falling behind can also be the, the basis for assistance programs and assistance to those actors that need more health improving or more help improving their environments. So to sort of just finish off on this, this line of thought, you know, thinking about three levels of measurement and accountability is important. Uh, I, I, we've had some dialogue even today, you know, about making the technology harder to corrupt. Um, I think there's, ch there's a challenge because of the economic incentives to deploy technology quickly but the notion that some of the fundamental systems that underlie our technology, both sort of at the hardware level and also at the network level, can be produced in a way that is easier to secure, particularly for individuals, I think is important. Uh, making, organizational, making organizations capable of pro uh, providing trust, I think, is also important. What are the standards by which cybersecurity in organizations like banks, like power companies, other, uh, like telecommunications providers, which we all rely on every day to conduct our lives, how do we get visibility in a, in a similar way across all these organizations so that we can trust the companies that you know, we use? We use? Um, the, fu the final level, and one where I put the Cyber Green logo up, there's a small nonprofit that very much tries to measure the general uh, ecosystem health of the, uh, particularly the internet backbone in different environments globally and tries to get down to the national level in terms of which countries are doing better or worse in securing their, their internet ecosystems. And it, that is the type of thing that I think is uh, fundamentally important in terms of creating the accountability and responsibility necessary to foster a healthier global ecosystem. You know, I'll finish off with just sort of uh, like the way forward. So where do we go? Um, I do think it's important to be real, like to ground ourselves in reality. I think cybersecurity and the risks in cyberspace, while they're increasingly well recognized, are still getting worse. Um, I, you know, I, I, having ten years ago, I would have said. Most policymakers don't understand this issue at all. Very few people really understand cybersecurity uh, and the fact that there is risk out there. I think now we've reached the, the place where the environmental issue was about 20 years ago. People realize there's an issue that you know, global warming is ha happening, that treating the environment poorly is a bad thing, but behaviors haven't changed uh, enough and that we are still probably getting behind in terms, or we are still getting behind in terms of the, the risk of cyber attack, the challenges of cyber crime. Um, in terms of the projected future, you know, I think, you know, I personally don't think we can rely on a technological solution, um, you know, in the near term. I think technology probably uh, still is a creates more risk, some for good reason, because we're going to use more technology for more good things, others because attackers are going to be able to 
take advantage of the increased attack surface and attack more effectively. So we have to rely on people and processes. And I guess my primary thought here, you know, is that each of us need to think about being resilient in a cyber environment that is messy and swampy, and we need to get to, you know, uh, being ready at all levels. Individuals need to understand the risks that they undertake when they, when they operate in cyberspace. Companies need to make sure that their environments are sound, but they can also and under, you know, handle disruptive attacks. I'm hopeful that nations can learn to collaborate more like we talked about, but certainly national critical infrastructure protection programs and, and other sorts of measures have to be in place. Uh, and then finally, and where, you know, why I'm here in large measure today, but I think the notion of encouraging collaboration and dialogue, that the people element of having a having an environment where bad acts are possible, but that people have created rules and created incentive structures so that they collaborate as opposed to, you know, misuse the opportunities that they have to, you know, conduct attacks and take advantage of this insecure environment is going to have to be part of it. That the environment itself won't become technologically safer, that the environment will become safer through deeper understanding of the challenges, I think between nations, deeper understanding of the perspectives that, the, uh, that other nations have, trying to decide that there are areas where to keep off, you know, off limits uh, in terms of attacks and making sure that the communications and understanding is, is there to avoid unintentional escalation. So I'll leave a few minutes for questions and uh, conclude my remarks there. from here it's a bit easier if you have any questions just uh, kindly raise your hand and I'll run around with the microphone or my colleague Cherry runs around with the microphone um, who's willing to go first well I don't need to run that far uh, mm -hmm. could you kindly introduce yourself to the audience uh, Chris Hobson I'm also a fellow here at CCRC so one of the things you're talking about was basically how the incentive structures don't work at the moment, right? So we've got a collective action problem and also specifically here, like the economic incentives don't necessarily work with kind of creating a safer kind of cyber ecosystem, right? right? Um, could you perhaps talk about maybe some ways that these incentive structures can be changed? And one thing you did point towards related to this, one thing you pointed towards towards the start of your talk was basically the private sector respecting the pu public sector to take, take care of this and vice versa. I did, yeah, and I didn't follow through um, as much as I yeah. might have. So, yeah, I think, Chris, that something I could have talked more about, maybe should have, is what is the role of regulation, right? So in, in many public policy problems, if, if the normal economic instruct in incentives are not going to re result in the right thing for society. Government is seen as the place to go to in terms of creating rules that get there. There's been a lot of discussion in this in cyberspace. I think it varies from industry to industry. It certainly varies in country to country. Globally, um, certain governments you know, with a priority on public safety, you know, or control, and we get into a separate discussion of you know, sort of the intent to reduce political dialogue or to keep people safe, um, regulate more heavily. So I think that's the sort of essential uh, approach. I, I will tell you that I believe that governments are not well postured to regulate, um, that the technology moves so fast that the sort of nature of the things that they're, the way people use it, the way companies use technology, doesn't fit within the cycle of governmental control very well, that leaves us in the uncomfortable position of the private sector trying to set rules and standards that achieve these better outcomes. But the, the problem is the actors, you know, the private sector actors may not put enough weight on things. This gets, again, I think back to the uh, metaphor of the environment, is that then the people need to demand the proper behavior of the providers. If we think about some of the current uh, discussions about the tech big technology platforms and the fact they've been abused, will the big technology platforms 
be driven by their users to provide environments with more privacy and security uh, as opposed to the governments having to tell them how to do it and then sort of uh, degrading the environments because they're over-regulated. There's, there's not an easy answer here, but it's sort of a constant uh, dialogue that's necessary. Um, any further questions from anyone in the audience? Uh, Sparky from KGRI and JP Suit. Uh, I'm wondering what we can learn from a uh, fi global financial system. I think um, global financial system is governed by, of course, the global regime like WTO, World Bank, IMF. At the same time, uh, it's, it's led and managed by private sector and uh, the sovereign states have their own regulation. So it's a mixture of uh, uh, global governance and state-led governance. And it's relatively, to me, it looks relatively stable. Of course, we have an uh, imbalance in taxation, money laundering, and all the frauds, <laughs> and many others. But, but still, the financial system exists, and we can, we can rely on we, we can rely on it. Right. So, from your experience as a chief security officer, or, or, or from a global uh, invest bank, bank, investment bank experience, what, what we can steal from them? I think the notion of multiple layers of governance or rule setting is a good one and applies to cyberspace. Um, most of the sort of activity between the banks is governed by the rule of law and contract, and therefore, you know, the the notion that you won't, you you can't abuse the system because you've got a legal obligation to your partner when you move money, and that when you you move money through a wire, that that money is going to you know gets into an account, and the people that you wired it to have to handle it properly. That's actually the dominant layer. Um, Governments have stepped in, you know, quite a bit to ensure public safety. And, you know, this environment is not completely safe, but the amount of regulation on banks around the globe here in Japan, in the United States, in Singapore, in China, you know, all of, all of the governments make sure that the banks are, have the right sorts of controls in cybersecurity for it to be one of the least risky environments to interact with in terms of computing and digital. At the global le or the, so, yeah, the global level or the international level, the governance is not as strict, but after the financial crisis, so there's another sort of key example. That system was increasingly not governed, and that resulted in sort of the, st the structural conditions in 2008, where products were being offered that were effectively unsafe. They were built on financial models, that once, you, once the, some of the assumptions of the models were challenged, the entire global economy came apart. So what happened is over 10 years, and you know, I know that the CEO of JP Morgan has sort of publicly stated, we needed governments to step in, create some regulations, ensure that some of the structural conditions in the global financial system were in place so that we wouldn't have a repeat of that event. Now, again, it's a complex system, and I think we can't, you know, we can't do everything, but I think it's a safer system in terms of the banks are required to hold more money back, and what's called a liquidity crisis is not as prevalent because of the role of global bodies. There's something called the Basel Committee, which is the big global banking regulator, and they set up rules to try to increase stability. So I think, you know, if the notion is action needs to be taken at all three of those levels to make that environment safer, and that you know, inherently it's the day-to-day, -day, you know, behavior that the people are self incented to, but for these big risks that there's a role for government and even global management of those issues, I think that does apply to cyberspace. Yeah, uh, David Litt with KO Law School. Um, I wanted to ask about this concept of identifying the transgressor. I guess you can sort of divide um, that you mentioned specifically critical infrastructure, financial system, um, global financial system, but the other part of this is democracy, 
Um, you know, we have an impeachment right now <laughs> going on, um, and one of the um, one of the key elements is this argument, um, potentially Russian disinformation somewhere that uh, the um, it wasn't the Russians who hacked the DNC; it was the Ukrainians, and that this CrowdStrike has some Ukrainian connection and there's some <laughs> server, you know, Sorry. that this, this doesn't die. Right. Um, and we had, you know, reports this week that Jeff Bezos had his um, malware potentially put on his phone by MBS um, uh, based on a personal WhatsApp connection. We have reports now, Microsoft reporting that the Iranians have tried to hack uh, hundreds of people connected to the 2020 um, election campaign. Um, you know, in advance, warning campaigns to be vigilant about this. How, how easy is it technically to identify the transgressor if we have a group like the Cyber Peace um, Institute um, uh, doing this, and how easy is it to actually um, educate the public, um, have trust in the results that come out so that when the transgressor is identified, um, it actually um, can be assigned to them because it seems not, that may not be so effective with protecting a, a, a massive attack on the global financial system by North Korea, but in a lot of these democracy related things, identifying the transgressor um, negates the attack completely. This is a very interesting question. Then I'm going to take it on at two levels. The, the, the first level, and, the, and I think the harder level, is, is misinformation an attack, right? You know, and like this is a, like the cybersecurity forums that, that I'm involved with have a, now started to get pulled into should Facebook have filters and, and decide what things should be put, you know, allowed to be up on Facebook because there might be untrue things yeah. in that. I actually think, you, like logically for me, I segment that issue and say that's not a cybersecurity issue. That's an issue which is very difficult and it's, you know, as a political scientist, I think democracies are challenged in a digital age because that's an issue of you know, who decides what the truth is and freedom of speech and some of these fundamental things that Western democracies have held out, held out as sort of key principles and now even in Western democracies you're seeing Maybe the government should tell Facebook they should put filters on what's on, the, on there. So that, that scares me, but I don't think it's a cybersecurity issue. To the issue of like, you know, a government going into a device in a country you know, or a website or a voting machine, and that's a computer intrusion, I do think you can call that a cybersecurity issue. I think there should be a norm that says Governments will not interfere and in, you know, conduct cybersecurity intrusions or attacks in order to interfere with the domestic political you know, processes of another country. This is where, again, the Cyber Green Institute, or sorry, uh, not the Cyber Green, the Cyber Peace Institute should, and I think will, you know, put out technical information that says, yes, you know, this set of intrusions on voting machines in Atlanta or Tokyo was conducted by, you know, th in this fashion with this malware. Again, that they have this decision about whether they're going to attribute that to a government you know, or just put that out there and sort of make it clear that this was governmentally motivated. You know, um, I think that does fall in this sphere. I, I worry actually more about the first, which is the content issue as opposed to the hacking issue. But the, the second, I do think, falls into the issue of like, you know, government should agree not to technically interfere with each other's in elections. Now, I introduce all the panelists. I will walk up there again. So Craig can have a seat and take a minor break for a few minutes.